Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, I think probably the most popular topic on this show are success stories. And today I have one that will blow your mind. My guest is Ron Dinuvin, and she lost over 200 pounds. She's calling her presentation, Harness the Hangry, Journey of a Recovering Crapaholic. Please welcome Rondi to the show. Another cover girl. I think you're the fourth or fifth cover girl we've had on this show. It's great to be here, Chef AJ. I'm really honored that you invited me to come on the show. Well, I think your story is amazing because, I mean, first of all, any amount of weight that anybody loses, that's amazing. But to lose as much as you did and to keep it off, that's even doubly amazing. So are you going to tell us how you did it? I will tell you how I did it. Um, the uh, presentation kind of focuses on the mental journey that I go through trying to keep it off for the last eight years. Um, so if I just quickly do the presentation and then you can talk after that and I'll sure. let you know how it, I did it. You, have, you, you do not have to do it quickly, but I, it's interesting. <laughs> what I heard you say trying to keep it off, trying. And it's, sorry, keeping it yeah. off. Yeah, no, but but because uh, I but that's important because you know they, mm -hmm. they, they, that's where the rubber meets the road that most people can lose weight. It's the keeping it off that befuddles so many people. Well, and it's and when you feel like I've been on, I've been blogging, and I feel like oh, if I put on a few pounds, I'm a, I failed, and then I have to remind myself all the time that ninety five percent of people, I think that's the statistic, don't keep weight off. Um, so I congratulate myself on that. Well, congratulations. Success. I can't wait to hear the whole story. Um, so I will just start now. Great. So this is my diary of a crapaholic presentation. Uh, dear diary, I feel like a fraud and a failure. I've been on the cover of three magazines for my 200 pound weight loss. And now all of my clothes are tight and all I can seem to focus on is when I'm going to eat next. Why can't I control myself when I know better? Some inspiration I am. I'm beginning to wonder how I ever managed to lose the weight to begin with. Dear diary, I feel helpless. Came across the term food addict and thought, hey, that's me. And then I realized that the stuff I crave isn't actually real food. I don't go crazy for kale. It's carbonated, refined, artificial, processed junk pretending to be food. I am a crapaholic. I tried to binge on celery instead, but my jaw got sore. <laughs> Dear diary, I feel angry. There is so much messaging around crap food that everything is fine in moderation. This is what the evil geniuses running the processed food industry want me to think as they actively research and implement ways to make the crap even more addictive. And it's everywhere. Why does Staples need junk food at the checkout? Dear diary, I feel conflicted. I worked out this morning, just like every day. The whole time, all I could think about is that it's a good thing I work out every day because I couldn't wait to get to work. There's a bowl down the hall with Linders. I know I shouldn't eat Linders. I ate three Linders. Monday. I'll start again on Monday. It's always Monday. Dear diary, I feel ashamed. I needed to go to Costco today to get my salad supplies. I told myself, go in the morning before the samples are out, but instead I went mid-afternoon when the samples are plentiful and grabbed myself a fountain pop. I think it's so awesome how the sample folks all know me by name. Oh, wait, maybe that's a bad sign. Dear diary, I feel depressed. Went to bed with a samples bellyache and a new resolve last night. Woke up this morning wondering, what's the point of living if I can't have any crap? Then wondered, what's the point of living in a state of craving, always seeking that something that will make the craving go away, but never finding it. Then I sighed and mustered my resolve. Dear diary, I feel deflated. After a day of good food choices, I decided to visit mom and dad. No, it had nothing to do with the fact that they keep chocolate chips in their garage fridge. Yes, it was necessary to go through the garage when I arrived. And when I left, had chocolate chips with pocket lint when I got home. This can't be normal. Dear diary, I feel duped. All this time believing diet pop would help me, but research shows that when I drink diet pop, my body prepares for the calories it thinks are coming, which never come, which messes with my insulin response and actually makes me want more food. Tomorrow, tomorrow will be the day I give up diet pop. I'll just finish what's in the fridge first. 
Dear diary, I feel exhausted. For some reason, I didn't sleep very well last night. Wasn't functioning all that great at work. So I told myself I would get just one diet pop out of the machine to perk me up. But then I was tired again. So I got an epic polar pop. Actually, I got two thinking I might save one for tomorrow. <laughs> Sorry, this entry is so short. I have to pee. Dear diary, I feel apathetic. It's Monday again, but it's Christmas this weekend. Is there really any point in trying to get this under control in the meantime? Don't answer that. I can't even claim ignorance anymore, but despite knowing better, I'm going to binge on all the things that I'm going to give up in the new year. Shh, don't judge me. Dear diary, I feel annoyed. I'm biologically designed to seek out calorie-dense foods because our ancestors faced scarcity. They had to crack nuts by hand, forage for berries, drag holes in maple trees. Meanwhile, I can get 600 nutritionally void calories from three forkfuls of poutine stolen from my granddaughter along with scratches from where she stabbed my thieving hands with her fork. Dear Diary, I feel broken. Did you know that there are people out there who don't think about food every waking minute? I realized it would be easier if I could bring myself to completely abstain from sugar, alcohol, fat, flour, and salt. So basically all ingestible sources of instant happiness. Okay, wonderful, fine. In the new year. Dear Diary, I feel hangry. Not sure how that's possible since I ate enough in the last 24 hours to sustain a small family for a week. I know that it's because I ate so many empty calories and my body is still looking for actual nutrition. But do I go for actual nutrition? No, mom made poppycock. I can't hurt her feelings, right? Dear diary, I feel distracted. It's now officially the new year. I spent just about every minute today trying not to think about diet pop. That fizzy, wonderful, 200 times sweeter than sugar elixir of joy. Tell you what, don't think about an elephant. Yeah, that's how my day went. Good thing the universe worked in my favor because the Coke machine was out of diet. Dear diary, I feel motivated. I came up with a mantra to remind myself why I should make better food choices. To move, to think, to smile, to shrink, to cleanse, to feel, to sleep, to heal. Pain-free, clear thinking, better mental state, restful sleep. These are the things that await me after a few weeks of whole food plant-based compliance. Why do I keep going back? Dear diary, I feel sore. Day three. Day three always sucks. I can speak with authority on this because there have been so many day threes. I had a wicked headache. All my muscles hurt. My thoughts were foggy. Withdrawal sucks. Why do I insist on doing it repeatedly? Apparently, I'm a very slow learner. Dear diary, I feel accomplished. I made it to the end of the week. One week of consistently better choices. Not perfect, but better. In one week, my resting heart rate went down. I sleep better. I've lost seven pounds of inflammation. Why do I ever go back to eating crap? If only my addictive substances weren't sold everywhere branded as food. Dear Diary, I feel shocked. As I was doing my best singing in the shower this morning, I stopped short when it occurred to me that I hadn't thought about food yet. Normally, my first thought upon waking is, when can I eat and what am I eating? Of course, then I thought, when can I eat and what am I eating? But it is possible to forget about it for a while. It's like a mental vacation. How nice to have some bandwidth to think about something else for a change. Dear Diary, I feel like a little bit of a zealot again. I feel so good that I want to tell everyone how many things can be helped by a whole food plant-based diet and how important it is to focus on nourishment instead of losing weight and how the processed food industry is a conspiracy to make us all addicts for the sake of profits. I don't though, because sounds crazy, but it's true. Dear diary, I feel hopeful. Maybe I'm not a fraud and a failure. Maybe I'm just an average person navigating a world of temptation. Maybe I need to eat crap occasionally to feel good so that I have a frame of reference for it. This vicious cycle, I've been here before, and odds are that I'll be here again. But for now, I'll take the win. Oh, there we go. Thank you. You you have good present. Do you have, do you have any experience like in acting? You had that very nice presentation, almost like watching a play. Um, actually, I do a little bit, just a little bit of musical theater. Yeah, because that was wonderful. So. Tell me your story from the very beginning. Were you always struggling with food and weight? I actually can't remember a time that I wasn't focused on my weight and food from a pretty young age. Um, I remember grade six 
having to order something from the Sears catalog. Do you remember the Sears catalog? I do. And, and, and people it, are saying the way you called it pop. I'm from the Midwest and a lot of people don't know what pop is. It's soda, but that's what oh, we call it so, too. Yeah. In Canada, it's pop. Um, I, I was kind of chunky my whole life. I was a pretty active kid though. I swam, I did uh, speed swimming, competitive swimming, and I would ride my bike four and a half miles to town every day, but I was kind of relentlessly bullied at school. And I think I turned to food as a uh, comfort as a lot of people do. Um, by the time I was uh, in high school, I went to a boarding school and that's when things really went off the rails because nobody was watching me anymore. And <laughs> I worked in the kitchen and what we made for meals was, wasn't exactly health promoting, shall we say. There was a store across the street and I became intimately familiar with Ruffles salt and vinegar chips and something purely Saskatchewan, raspberry beep. If there's anybody from Saskatchewan on here, they'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Um, and I just, I never, I, I flirted with diets, but I never really stuck to anything for longer than maybe a week. So my weight just kept going up and up and up and up and up. What age did you first notice you might be overweight and, and, and were you, because, you know, a lot of people, they were, when they look back, they weren't, but they, you know, they felt this need to be thinner, but did, were you actually overweight as a child? Um, well, when I look back, not, not as overweight as my brain remembers, if that makes sense. Um, I think I was, when I was a kid, there weren't as many overweight kids. So I was the overweight kid in the class. Same here. Yep. Um, plus I was, I had naturally curly hair that my mom kept super short to deal with it. And I had glasses and, you know, I was kind of, I want, wanted so badly to be liked. I was kind of the annoying kid. And my grandma would say stuff to me, like you have such a pretty face and you know, you kind of interpret that as mm, rest of me sucks. Okay. <laughs> um, great. Good to know. And I think there was a lot of focus on weight. Like my grandma would always, if we saw somebody, it was always, Oh, that person's gained weight or, Oh, that's person's lost weight. And my, my dad learned that from his mother. So everybody was always focused on weight. And when you get called fat in kindergarten, it just kind of sticks in your head. Wait, wait, were you, were other family members overweight? Um, a little bit, but, um, like mom, I, I'm mom had a mom shows her love with food. So, but we always had, uh, what I would call clean food. I grew up on a farm. So, you know, I used to love to go to my friend's house because her mom let her have alphabets. So I'd be able to have alphabets if we had a sleepover. We never had stuff like that. It was meat, potatoes, vegetables. It was clean food, but mom showed her love that way. Um, I recall her being on Weight Watchers and my dad trying all sorts of different things to, I don't know, there was some meal program. I can't remember which one it was, but I don't, look back very often. So when people ask me about my past, I really have to think about it because I try not to let my past define my present. And that's part of how I was able to lose the weight. Yeah. So, so tell us what, what, like, did you hit a rock bottom moment? Did you have a disease or something like what made you decide that you were going to do it and when? And I know there's, there's a lot of stories that you hear where, oh, I had diabetes and I, I would go to the doctor, they would weigh me and then they would look at my blood work and then they would look at me and then look at my blood work again and be like, I don't get it. I was a medical enigma. They, they, they would say, you should lose some weight and kind of look at me like your blood work's okay, but you should still lose some weight. Um, and I became quite happy with who I was as a person. And I think that has a lot to do with my health because I was happy. I didn't, I didn't really stress too much about being overweight, but then I wanted to travel and I got a, I got a travel bug and the, I always say there's two things people need to know about me. I love food and I'm cheap or frugal as my friends try to say instead of cheap. Um, and I could travel in Canada uh, and get two seats for free. But if I wanted to leave Canada, I had to pay for a second seat on an airline. And so, you know, cheap and loving food got along really well for a while until that clash. And then I had, okay, well, if I want to, if I want to go outside of Canada, I'm going to have to lose some weight. And that's kind of what really 
I didn't want to make other people uncomfortable. I didn't care if I was uncomfortable on the plane, but social media tells me that people struggle if you're taking up half their seat. Like there's some horrible stories on social media. Um, so that was what started it for me. That, and that how, was, how, I just wanted to fit into a single airplane seat. That's that. Well, that's a worthy goal. I know somebody that was, wanted to lose weight just so they could fit in a certain ride it, that their child really wanted to go on. So there's no, there's no, you know, bad reason. How old were you at the time? Uh, that was in 2014. So I would have been 43 when so I started. About 10 years. You look really young. That, so did you ever heard about a vegan or a plant-based diet? Well, Hmm. Yeah, probably. And yeah, probably. I shouldn't say yeah, probably. I had, I had heard about it over and over and over again. My dad um, went vegan and he was kind of born again. Um, and I know Dr. Lyle says all these things when you're trying to talk to people, you know, say you're doing an experiment and, and my dad did it completely wrong. And he, you know, would say there's no other way to lose weight other than a vegan diet. So I set out to prove him wrong. <laughs> so I lost the weight with calorie restriction, but I wish I either listened to my father. He's going to love that. I said that or done a little bit more research because if I had done it a different way, I wouldn't, all, I lost a lot of hair um, my nails weren't in great shape because I wasn't getting enough nutrition with caloric restriction. Um, but I, that's how I, I lost the weight. But, okay. So you basically ate whatever you wanted, but just less of it. Well, no, I added, I started adding greens. Um, I, and I kind of stayed away from the processed food then, but I was still eating, um, like egg white omelets and chicken breasts. And I was doing what I now know is not the best way, but I was staying away from carbs. Right. So I wasn't eating a lot of rice or if I, if I went to a restaurant, I would have chop suey, chicken chop suey, no carbs. And then, um, I would do a caloric I called it a caloric confusion day. I didn't like calling it a cheat day because for me, losing weight was all about the mental side of it. So I did a caloric confusion day and I noticed that I would lose more weight when I did that, which was weird, but hey, it worked for me. So that's what I did. Um, but I, I rolled into whole food plant-based kind of organically. I started adding, I wanted, I eat, I like to eat a lot and I know, I, I know there's people who can relate to that. It's like caloric can, or caloric restriction wasn't great for me because I like to eat a lot of food. So I started adding more vegetables. Um, and that's how I would kind of crowd out the other, the other stuff got crowded out because I kept adding more vegetables and I did not like them when I started at all. Um, vegetables used to be the thing that I bought and put in the fridge and then they would be sent to their untimely death in the garbage can a week later. Um, but I told myself not everything has to be a party in my mouth. This is good for me. Being hungry is good. It leads to the results that I want. I did a lot of mental work. It was a lot of mental work. What kind of mental work though? Could you, could you give us a, an example? Yep. Um, well, I was, I was, as I said, I was, fortunate in the fact that I loved myself already. And that's a big thing. I think it's really, really important to love, to love yourself before you start any change. The change can't be what makes you happy. You have to be happy before you can make the change in my experience anyway. Um, so I started with loving myself. I started with being kind to myself. I also realized that I hadn't gained 200 pounds overnight and I wasn't going to lose it overnight because all of the other um, things that I had tried over the years, you want like instantaneous results. Like I want to lose four pounds overnight. So I learned to accept that it was going to be slow. I also accepted that I was never going to be able to have a family size sized bag of munchies for breakfast again. Um, and I worked on 
the conversations within my head. And that's where hangry comes in. Um, for me, hangry is that thing, that monster that sits on my shoulder and says, eat all the food all the time. So I started personifying that and having that conversation in my head of like, no, I realize you're, you really want this, but no, we're not going to have it. I actually stopped saying I can't and started saying I choose not to. That was huge. That was a very important change. Um, People would say, oh, I forgot you're on a diet. You can't have this. And I would say, oh, I can have that. I'm just choosing not to. It won't lead to the results that I want if I do. So I'm choosing not to. And when it becomes a choice, it, for some reason, it hurts less. <laughs> um, so that was those were part of the mental, the mental changes. Things like uh, the first bite tastes the same as the last bite. I don't need all the bites in between. Um, um, I'm trying to think of a couple other ones that I would use. I mean, people will tell me what they think and I can give them an opposite of it, but I do you think I can come up with it right now. No, it's okay. I, that's funny. The caloric confusion day. Why do you think that led to greater weight loss? Um, I don't, I, I honestly don't know. I I've, I've read a little bit of research that maybe it can, it, uh, I don't know, confuses the, metabolism and you know it, it takes you out of that when you're in caloric restriction you go into your metabolism slows down honestly the stuff that worked I was just so happy it was working I just kept doing it so I I don't have the science behind why it worked maybe some people somebody would it kept me sane anyway do you, do you still enjoy caloric confusion days no, but I love Costco samples. Oh, that's so funny. I was at Costco today. They finally got <laughs> organic dates back in. Yay. T tell me a little bit about what you used to eat before you first lost the 200 pounds, what you ate during that period where you were doing caloric restriction and what you eat now. Um, I was thinking about that the other day for breakfast. I used to have um, a garlic sausage with cheddar cheese and Ritz crackers. How I thought that was a good breakfast, I don't know, but, and then I would have, I or a bagel, um, giant mounds of spaghetti, meat sauce, cheese, garlic bread. I mean, every time we went to a restaurant, it was some sort of pasta slash bread slash meat. Vegetables were always kind of an afterthought and I ate some of them, but mostly the the regular piece, carrots, corn, kind of, there was no leafy greens or occasionally broccoli, occasionally cauliflower. And on the way down, when I started using uh, my fitness pal was how I figured out how many calories I was taking in. And I found out what a serving of pasta looks like. I was like, what? That's not a serving. That's like, I need four or five of those to feel satisfied. Oh my goodness. So then that was when wheat and bread and flour products kind of just worked their way out because they were too high in calories. So that was slowly, by the time I was done losing weight and in, in maintenance mode, I was eating smoothies, salads, and egg white omelets with steamed vegetables. That was kind of my diet, but I was finding that I had to eat like, hmm. 12 to 1600 calories a day to stay like, and, um, I was listening to your weight loss summit today. And somebody was talking about that, how, after you lose weight, you have to eat somebody the same weight can eat way more calories. Than yeah. It's, it's, called, it's called either the caloric penalty or metabolic disadvantage. It's not fair, but from what I'm understanding, at least from the doctors I've interviewed is that it does correct itself because even though I'm like 70 pounds lighter now, I can, I, I can eat a lot more than I did like, you know, those first few years after becoming slender. I mean, yes. Yeah. So I do think of the thing is, is I think what happens is, is you probably know most people that lose weight gain it back and it's usually within two years. So they've never really been able to study this, but for the people that have kept it off, I don't have to eat tiny little bit of food anymore. Right. And it, and it's been 2016. So eight years this year, um, that I've maintained kind of within a range, a maintenance range. Um, 
I, I, yeah, every time I hear those, it's like two years. Wow. I made it. <laughs> and everybody would come up and say, oh, you've got to, you've got to share your story. It's like, it's not a story yet. Losing weight wasn't the story, keeping it off. Now I feel like I have a story to tell because I've managed to keep it off, managed to keep hangry at bay. And, and how was the keeping it off? Did you, what do you white knuckle it? Is it easy now? Is it still hard? Is it, if you don't go to Costco, is it hard? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I would really, I would really love to be able to tell everybody that, oh yeah, it's easy. Once you keep, once you get it off, it's it, it, no, um, I know I aspire to be chef AJ someday getting rid of the sofas completely. I don't, there's hardly any alcohol, not a lot of flour. I can live without salt. No problem. Um, but me and sugar, me and sugar have a so sugar. So yeah. sugar is your thing, but sugar in itself, well, so I guess what I mean, what I, one of the things I learned from Dr. Lyle is that I wasn't really a sugar addict because I was a sugar fat addict. You know, even though I had a lot of Coke Slurpees and Dr. Peppers, you know, sugar in and of itself is not always a problem for people. Twizzlers, you know, gummy bears. It's the sugar fat combination or the sugar flour yeah. combination, you know. Butter and brown sugar is the golden elixir of life. I yeah, so, so that's that's a sugar fat combination. So yeah. you're, you're like, because you know, you're like, like, are you, do you eat a lot of like low fat sugar free things like Twizzlers or or no, not sugar free. Nope. You know what I mean? No, I actually, well, I gained weight during COVID because Costco didn't have samples. Uh -oh. Honestly, it's a very, it's a very strange thing. But if I know that at some point during the week, I can go have just a little bit of something sweet, I do much better um, than when that wasn't there. Um, but I also know, and I am aware, when I eat too much sugar, I get inflammation, I get really sore. Um, and I'm also aware that eating a little bit of sugar brings on the desire to eat more sugar, which is why I aspire to get away from that completely. So that, that suffering and that craving, I do know having done a few experiments that it will quiet down, you know, um, the reason I ended up whole food plant-based wasn't actually for me. It was for, for, I was going, I was going in solidarity with a friend of mine. She came over one day and she said, Oh, sorry. I haven't seen you for a while. I'm on this new drug and for her, my diabetes and I'm puking every day. Mm. I said, you're puking every day. Yeah. And I said, well, I just found this website, which was Dr. Gregor's nutritionfacts.org. And I said, and I, I had got the, how not to, it was out there, how not, how not to die or how not to die at cookbook. I said, are you willing to give whole food plant-based a try. Like it can't, it can't be worse than throwing up every day. It can't be. So she said, okay, I'll do it. And I said, I will, I will do it with you. We will, we will go in solidarity and I haven't gone back to meat. That's for sure. That is fantastic. Are you familiar with Dr. Lyle's ego trap? Ego trap, no pleasure trap. Yes, the, the ego trap. It, it's um, it's, it's a fantastic uh, podcast he has called "Beat Your Genes" every other Wednesday, and he talks about. I believe it's episode one. It's either one sixty one or one sixty three. But he talks about how when people set the bar too high, they often fail. And it mm -hmm. sounds to me that even though you might not have ever heard of the concept of the ego trap, you instinctively know it. That for you setting the bar at perfection, Dr. Goldhammer is going to not be good for you. And so you allow yourself a little bit understanding that a little bit makes you want more, but it seems like you you have a good handle on it. Yeah. It, um, <laughs> Oops, sorry. I accidentally turned my camera off. No, but it's so cute. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, yes, it's true. Um, I, I feel like I can maintain for me anyway, maintain with just a little bit, like you said, do the least restrictive thing possible. Um, and I do, I, I do want people to know that whole food plant-based sofa free is like gold standard for sure. I mean, if everybody could do that, everybody should do, you know, it's, it's the gold standard, but I did lose over 200 pounds naturally, no medical intervention. Um, and it, it was caloric confusion. It is possible. It is possible. You don't have to, like you said, touch that, 
set the bar so high that, and it didn't happen for me overnight. It was a, I made small sustainable changes to start losing weight. I didn't wake up one morning and say, okay, I'm just going to change absolutely everything about my life. I started with breakfast. Two weeks later, I changed lunch. Two weeks later, I changed supper. Um, When I started exercising, I could barely do five minutes on the treadmill, but instead of beating myself up, you know how you say to yourself, oh, I'm so, I'm useless. I can't even do five minutes. I stopped doing that. And I started doing the patting myself on the back saying, good job, five minutes, man. You didn't do five minutes yesterday. So we'll get up tomorrow and we'll do six. That kind of slow, sustainable changes. My whole diet is, I'm not eating a single thing now that I was eating before. Like there's, there's just no, there's not now it's, you know, salads and oatmeal and grains and sweet potatoes and, and berries and all the super foods, (laughs) health promoting foods. That's I would like to go to the true North center someday and do a fast. Um, because diet pop was my thing. It's been diet soda. Sorry. Diet soda. Yep. Yep. No, me too. Uh, I mean, first it was regular soda and then it was diet soda. Yeah. Uh, proud to say it's been 20 days now again, it'll stick one of these times. It will. I'm 100% convinced. How did a women's world magazine find you? Well, that was an interesting story. Um, That was, I found nutritionfacts.org and I started reading all this stuff on nutritionfacts.org and I went, oh my goodness, this is why what I did worked. There were so many things that, oh my goodness, that's why it worked. I I instinctively moved towards this diet um, by making the small sustainable changes and then realizing, okay, that makes me feel better. Okay, this isn't happening anymore. Okay, my pain's gone away. And it was so refreshing to find this website that provided all of this information for free and wasn't trying to sell me something. Therefore, I had more confidence in the fact that it was accurate. And I ended up writing um, a testimonial in to nutritionfacts.org. And I said, hey, like, I am so happy I found you guys. If I had had this before I started losing weight, I might not have lost all my hair. (laughs) nails might have been in good shape. And, and I, I really appreciate this website and I've lost all this weight and women's world was doing a story on, um, Dr. Gregor and whole food plant-based. And they asked, uh, nutritionfacts.org for a testimonial. So nutritionfacts.org reached out to me and they asked if I would agree to be in this women's world magazine. And I said, yeah, for sure. I'm, I, I remember being maybe a teenager and in my early twenties, standing in the line at the till and looking at this magazines and going, that can't be real. This has to be fake, (laughs) but I still wanted to be one of the people on the magazine. I wanted to, I wanted to be the person standing in one leg of her old pants. I, I wanted that. So women's world, uh, reached out and contacted me and, and it was during, during COVID. So they were just about to send a photographer into my home and, uh, we went into shutdown again. So the photographer couldn't come to my home. Um, and they, I remember the, the lady, she sent me an email saying, okay, you need to wear bright colored jewel tones with, and form fitting. And I was like, you realize I was a big girl once, right? Like I don't do form fitting and everything I own is black. So the first cover that I was on, I was wearing a borrowed shirt. I bought the high heels just for the sh- shoot and then took them back because I never wear high heels. <laughs> um, but when they called the photographer in medicine hat, he thought it was a joke. He was like, what is this? is this some sort of a scam? Like a shoot for women's world? What's going on here? So that was how I ended up on the first. And I actually didn't know I was going to be on the cover until they sent me the art. And I was like, Oh, I'm on the cover. Um, and the second one, 
uh, they were doing, that was the special edition, the whole food plant-based over 50 special edition. They contacted me again. And I mean, I realized that a lot of, a lot of these magazines, they're written, the headlines are written to get your attention. I mean, I think over top of me is drop 24 pounds in seven. I didn't drop 24 pounds in seven days and they don't claim that I did, but that's the headline and that's how they get people to buy the magazines. But I, I think to myself anyway, to get the message out there about whole food, plant-based unprocessed eating is a good way. That's my theory. Yeah, absolutely. Did, did people who knew about this magazine? Did you, did your coworkers see it? Did your family see it? People on the street? Well, I have, uh, a blog. I have a little bit of a following. So they, they were all excited for it to come out. Um, mom and dad. Oh yeah. Very proud. Very proud. Um, I remember telling my dad once he, that he would pry cheese from my cold dead hands. So he's, he's pretty proud. I don't eat cheese anymore. Um, did he stay yeah. vegan? Oh yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, he, he realized it took a few years, but he realized that there's a difference between a vegan and a junk food vegan. Um, that's why I more identify whole food plant-based because it's, I, I can't remember which doctor it is. It says, I think Goldhammer says it's possible to be a, you know, French fries and ketchup and you can be a, maybe it was Dr. Gregor. Anyway, you can, you can live on French fries and ketchup and still call yourself a vegan. So I identify more whole food plant-based um, yeah. did exercise ever play a role in, in your 200 pound weight loss? And was that your, your, like your most valiant attempt or did you lose weight on and off during your life? I didn't really, I, that was my most valiant attempt. I didn't really lose weight on and off. I would try something, like I said, for maybe seven days, I flirted with weight watchers. I, I'm not a joiner. I didn't like going to the meetings. I wasn't, a, wasn't big on the, you know, publicly standing on a scale that, that didn't speak to me. I did Tybo briefly. I think that lasted maybe a couple of weeks, but exercise definitely played a role in my journey. Um, although I did realize that, you know, weight loss happens in the kitchen mostly, but exercise is really good for, for health. Uh, so like I said, I started on the treadmill. Uh, I did Zumba there was a Zumba class in Redcliffe, lucky me at the time that was really cheap, 10 bucks for 12 weeks and not 10 bucks a session. It was 10 bucks. <laughs> um, and then I exercise, I exercise every day. I roll out of bed, my feet hit the floor. And the first thing I'm doing is exercising. That is the one thing that I, that has become a habit. I it's, it's like an addiction in itself. I have to exercise daily um, and for health. Have you ever heard of calor the concept of caloric density? Yes, absolutely. Because eat you went left. Well, yeah. One of the things you said earlier is you like to eat large volumes. So I'm curious if you had that knowledge when you started your 200 pound weight loss journey, because you can eat a lot of food and still lose weight if you're employing those principles. Yes. And I did not, I did not have that knowledge. I, that, that research I didn't have at the time I found out Again, it was organically. I found out through my fitness pal, I would start putting in stuff. I mean, that only lasted so long because my fitness pal is more designed for, you know, scan a barcode and everything pops in there. And I, I did get to the point where what I was eating, there were no barcodes. It was a pain in the butt to put it in there. Um, but I found out organically about calorie density because I was figuring out how many calories were in the food I was eating. And I'm like, oh, I can eat like, you know, tablespoon of chocolate chips or six cups of spinach. I'll take the spinach kind of thing. So again, it was something that I learned more about after the weight loss, but had I known before, I think it would have made a huge difference in how I lost the weight. And I probably would have felt a little less like I was missing something all the time. So what, how long did it take you to, it was 218 pounds, I believe, right? Two, well, somewhere in there. I mean, it was uh, two, maybe two thirteen. 
again, I went to the, the only reason I know what I weighed, I stayed off of the scale when I was big. The only reason I know is because I had to go to the doctor to get, and the airlines don't call it this, but I called it fat certified so that I could get two seats in Canada for uh, one fare. The only reason I, so it was, yeah, around 213 pounds. And now I've talked myself around to forgetting what your actual question was. Sorry um, about that. Um, how, how long did it take? Oh yes. About 18 months for me. It was uh, October. I started briefly in, in 2014. I was going to New York uh, in June. So I started in January, lost 30 pounds, went to New York. I don't know if you've had a New York bagel with cream cheese, but <laughs> my week didn't go so good. <gasps> and then uh, I kind of fell off the wagon, but I was, I was in a, uh, one of those musical theater productions and I came back and uh, a couple of months later, I went to costume fitting and, and the seamstress was looking at me like, uh oh, I'm like, oh, I guess I better get back on the wagon. So October 20th, 2014 is when I really feel like I kicked things into gear by July, 2016, I had hit kind of a maintenance range. And then I started looking at skin removal. Did, did you have that was going to, if it wasn't too personal, I was going to ask you, did you, did you have that? I did. Um, I remember going to uh, a doctor in Canada and he says, well, you can have skin removal or a high-end Mercedes. And I'm like, oh my goodness, it's going to cost that much. Like, wow. So I ended up uh, going down to Guadalajara, Mexico. Ooh. But I have a, I have quasi family down there. So I had an interpreter and, and uh, yeah, that was, that was an experience in itself. How long ago did you have it? That was 2017. Um, and they, once I got back here, um, I mean, at the risk of, you know, oversharing, I tried implants, but um, I was, my immune system was just like, nope, no, thank you not having these. Um, and, but when I was up here, they called me a healing machine. They, they'd never seen somebody heal so quickly. And I, I credit how I was eating for that. Although not how I was eating in the hospital. I can't believe what they give you in the hospital. What did they give you? Do you remember? Oh, I was, it was full of, I, I mean, I know the soups were full of salt and it was like, well, I mean, general fare, meat, mashed potatoes, pudding, jello, you know, all the typical hospital standard food. The food in Mexico was great. I got like veggies there, but not in Canada. Um, was it very painful, the operation? Um, well, again, I, I went into it uh, with a great mental mindset. Uh, there was pain. Sure. There was pain afterwards, but, um, I wouldn't let anybody, nobody was allowed to say anything negative. Nobody was allowed to talk about what could go wrong. I was fortunate in that the doctor in Mexico didn't talk about what could go wrong either. I don't think they have the same rules around, uh, having to tell you everything that could go wrong to avoid being sued. Maybe, I don't know, but he was like, I don't want to, I'm not going to tell you what the complications could be. Cause then you'll think about them. No, oh, go have a glass of wine. See ya. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I can't say it wasn't painful. It's like, it's like saying that coming off of sugar isn't going to be painful. It, things hurt, but you get, you get through them. And do, do you have to like have any kind of clearance to have this operation? So in other words, like, you know, when somebody's having gastric bypass, they often send them to a psychologist to make sure like, because if you, if somebody had the surgery you had, and then let's say gained the 200 pounds back, can that be a problem? Oh, I don't. Or I don't does know. the skin just restretch itself? That I don't know. I've never looked into that because I never intended to gain the 200 pounds. <laughs> well, that's a great attitude because I know people yeah. that have lost, you know, that much and more and unfortunately have. I was just curious about that. Yeah. yeah no, I didn't look into that. I didn't have to have any, any uh, mental health uh, screening or anything before I went down there. No. Like I, I go into things with as much of a positive mindset as I can. I think it's, it's really important. I, I choosing what you eat is important. 
having the mental strength to choose what to eat is, is where the skill and the test lies because I mean, even now I know what to eat. I know what's health promoting. I know. And despite knowing you can still not make the better choice. Um, but the mental, the mental gymnastics that I have to do sometimes it's, it's really important. Yeah. Well, it's, it's really interesting how you, you focus on the mental aspect. I don't hear that a lot. Most people are focusing just on the food. Have you ever thought about hmm. a book about that? Because that's, that's an important piece that a lot of people are missing. Yeah, I have one, uh, started. Is it in called process? Is it called harness the hangry? Uh, it'll probably be called Harness the Hangry Journey of a Recovering Crapaholic. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Virginia, possibly uh, tuned in a bit late and that's okay. She says, how is maintenance going? Maintenance is eight years in. Um, and again, I strive for progress, not perfection. I don't beat myself up. Um, I found the scale a really great motivator when losing weight. I found it to be detrimental in maintenance. Uh so I don't, I, I don't weigh myself every day. I don't weigh myself very often. I kind of go by how my clothes feel. And if they're getting a little tight, it's time to rein things back in again, get, get rid of the nuts and seeds for a little while and stay away from the Costco sample tables. Although then when I show up, it's like, they're like, where have you been? Are you okay? Anyway, <laughs> they all do know me by name. It's a small <laughs> town. <laughs> Hilarious. Were you working like a job when you lost your weight? And do you have the same job? Yeah. I'm curious, like, because it, it didn't happen overnight, but like your coworkers must have noticed at some point. Yes, that <laughs> it, it took about I was really quite large. I don't know if there's I don't know if I've shown a picture of what I used to. Could you um, could you could you show it? Yeah, we, I can. Yeah, to our newsletter. I, we, we would love to have that maybe make it as a thumbnail. Um, now I had thought I had set my timings off on my uh, PowerPoint, but I had not. Um, I mean, because I'm looking at that a picture. Blog. I mean, it looks like I mean, it just it's a very large boat woman. Uh, the the photo that I'm looking at compared to yes. cute, so that... cute T-shirt though. By the way, harness the hangry. <laughs> Thank you. And what I'm looking at, yeah. But did that come through? Is it? Yeah. Sharing? Oh my goodness. So you were like, uh, you were playing the Queen of Hearts? Queen of Hearts in Shrek the Musical. Yep. That's so though that was uh, the one on the, on the left side of the screen is 2012. I think Shrek was in 2013. And the, that was my New York picture. I, oh, no, that was New York in 2010, actually. And what, then what, I have. Can I ask what size, what size you were? Um, I'm sure that's a 5X t-shirt. Wow. Yeah. Uh, 20, probably 24 to 26 pant, depending on the day. And I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't unhappy. I didn't, I didn't lie down every night and think, oh, I'm a terrible person because I'm big. And, and like, I wasn't suffering in my mind because I was big. I knew I was, I knew I had value. I knew I was a good person. I knew, um, that I was smart and capable so I think that helped me. Um, and then I'll go to, I, I took pictures along the journey, but I wasn't intending to be, to, I wasn't intending to blog. I wasn't intending 50 pounds in people at work started saying, what are you doing? And I look at them and I'd say, well, I changed my diet and I exercise. And then they would go, oh, <laughs> They wanted me to say it's a pill or they wanted me to say I'm on this fancy program that'll I'm like, no, I had to completely change my, my life. Um, they started noticing it took about 50 pounds and that's where I was going with that. I was, I was quite large. So it, it took about 50 pounds before people started to notice, but once they did, they did start asking what I was doing. And that is, that's how I ended up with a blog, uh, because I couldn't, couldn't get any work done. Every time I'd go down a hall somewhere, somebody would ask me what I was doing and how is it working? And, and I'd get into these conversations. I now that after that, I could just say, just go to my, go to my blog. 
Mm. I, um, I was actually quite fortunate though, because I did it so as slowly as I did, um, the extra skin wasn't quite as dramatic as it can be with gastric, uh, with the invasive surgeries. Have you ever thought about this? Did you ever consider the surgeries? My dad offered for a number of years. I think he was, he was worried about me and I just never, I just never worried about bad things happening to me, but he was worried he would offer to pay for gastric bypass surgery. And I would say, you know what, dad, I will lose weight when I am ready. Well, when I do, I'll take the money that you're offering me and I'll go get skin surgery. (laughs) And did, did he do that? Part of it. Yeah. That's yeah. nice. Well, you seem to have a great attitude, you know, but do you, but other than the fact that it didn't seem like you had any medical issues, do you feel better with the less weight? Oh, it's, it's incredible. I mean, just being able to exist in the world is easier. I don't have to ask for, for chairs with no arms and just existing in the world, but feeling better is amazing. I didn't know how bad I felt until I no longer felt that way. Like that was just my normal. I didn't think it was that there, there is one, one story that is, uh, it's somewhat embarrassing, but I really don't have a, I have a pretty high bar for embarrassment. Um, I was at my mom and dad's house. They lived far away at the time, a couple hours away at the time. And I felt a twinge in my back and I was leaning over the table and it would hurt when I would lean and then it would be okay once I was there. And then I would stand up and it would hurt while I was standing up. And then once I stood up, it would be okay. And my husband and I went downstairs to go to bed and, uh, it just, it ceased. I couldn't, I couldn't move. It was so painful. And I mean, I'm, I'm 363 pounds at this point. And the only way that I can move is if I'm leaning backwards I had, I had to lean backwards. I don't know how far. And it took three grown men to help me get out of the basement and into the car. Cause I wanted to go home. I didn't, you know, I didn't want to be at my parents. I was in that much pain. And I distinctly remember getting to the top of the stairs and my dad looking at me saying, do you think it might be time to lose some weight? Mm. And me going, me going great message, crappy timing. Like I'm in agony here. Now it's not the time to deliver the message, but I haven't had a lot of pain like that. I mean, I move around all the time. I sleep better. Um, one really inspiring story. Um, and my husband gave me permission to share it because he has now, he didn't right away, but he's now joined me on this journey. Uh, he had really bad anxiety, really bad social anxiety. Um, And he noticed if he stopped, if he doesn't eat um, processed foods, the anxiety isn't there. Interesting. And we we have the same experience. If we all of a sudden decide we're going to go out and eat a pizza, you know, an hour later, we're looking at each other going, the world, it's going to end. The world, I'm convinced. It's that anxious feeling in the pit of your belly Anyway, and he's lost, he lost 80 pounds doing it too. And support is so important as well. I, he has loved me through every iteration of me and there have been many along the way and having somebody who supports you that way is really important. Absolutely. So here's a great question uh, from a live viewer. Let me pull it up. It is from uh, Diana. How is your environment and how was your environment during the weight loss phase? And how do you handle eating out? Um, my environment that is a great question. My environment now is really clean. Uh, I don't have things that tempt me in the house. Cause if it's in my house, it's, in, my it's in your house. Thank you. Yeah. I think there's somebody <laughs> who says that you just got to go to Costco. <laughs> <laughs> um, while I was losing weight at the, my husband wasn't on the same journey, but I had a conversation and said, like, we have to make our own food. I'm, I'm just going to make what I want to eat. Are you good with making what you want to eat? So that's what we did. He, I made, I made my food he made his food. So, um, my environment losing the weight 
was relatively clean. There was some stuff that I said to him, like, there's certain things you just, you can't have in the house. Like we can't have chocolate chips. I mean, I realize it's just, I can sit down and I eat a whole bag of chocolate chips. Like we couldn't have chips. We couldn't, there were some things that we couldn't have in the house, but I mean, he still had spaghetti and meat sauce and all that kind of stuff. Um, and how do I handle eating out? That is a really good question as well, because there's not a lot of places that I can go that I choose to go. Um, there's an uh, East Indian restaurant here that will make stuff with very little fat. And I actually take a container of chopped salad with me to put in with the rice and the, and the chickpeas or whatever it is that I get. Um, I eat at the chopped leaf. I don't know if that's a thing in the U S we have different restaurants. So giving, giving restaurant names might not be very helpful, but you can usually find a baked potato, steamed vegetables. I can usually find something to eat, but I just, we just don't eat out much. Are you afraid of carbs? No, <laughs> I used to be though. I used to be, I used to buy into that, but I'm not anymore. Nice. Has anyone gone vegan or lost weight because of you? Like maybe seeing your progress? My husband, for sure. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of people who have said that, that um, my blogs are inspirational. My friend, my friend who um, we went whole food plant-based together, she actually, for a while there, she had her A1C was normal. Um, and it was way, she was absolutely terrified to eat, terrified to eat a bowl of oatmeal. Mm. Like I can't, I can't eat oatmeal. They tell me I can't eat oatmeal. I'm like, well, you can eat oatmeal if you're not eating the meat. I can't eat oatmeal. <laughs> so I think there's a lot of information and I, it's dietitians so are doing it on purpose that that's what they're taught. Right. It, my brother was morbidly obese and he would tell me he can't eat carbs because they make him fat. And I'd say, well, with all due respect, you don't eat carbs and you're still fat. So it can't be the carbs, you know? Yes. Yeah. Interesting. I also, I also believe there's a piece of the mindset too, in, in, you know, the conversations that we have with ourselves as we're putting food in our mouth, like, oh, this is going to make me fat. Well, if that's what you're telling your body, you want to happen you know, our, we're designed to bring forth our reality. Don't, don't tell yourself that kind of stuff as it's going. Sorry. Yeah. I just I realized, we were, uh, sorry, Instagram, because Instagram, <laughs> see, I, we were still screen sharing. So sorry, I, I did stop that. Cause I love, if you can find that picture that you sent me that we put in the newsletter, I, I'd love to see that one though, if you can find it, but if you can't, don't worry. And uh, Susanna wants to know, did you experience Oh, it was about, and uh, my, 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 I, we have such an active chat. It, uh, it goes fast. Where did it go? Oh, did you experience any body dysmorphia when you lost your weight? And if so, as you maintain your weight loss, does it seem to go away? Hmm. That is a really good question as well. The body dysmorphia that I experienced was always, people would show me a picture and I'd be like, that's, I'm not that big. I'm not that big. And then people would show me a picture once I lost a bunch of weight and I'd be like, that's not me. Am I that small? <laughs> so there is, there is a, a, a connection in our brain with how we see ourselves. It's, it's not quite accurate. So I, I have found that I can have body dysmorphia depending on where I am at in my journey, for sure. I know if I feel like I'm gaining weight, what I see in the mirror change, shows me that I've gained like 15 pounds, kind of. It's uh, it, it depends on how I'm feeling. If I feel like I'm losing weight, then I'm looking in the mirror going, oh, look, I feel great. Look at me. It all depends on where I'm at in my journey, for sure. I'm just trying to find that. Uh, Virginia wants to know where she can get a t-shirt like yours that says, harness the hangry. Oh, well, I had them made. <laughs> so maybe I'll have to start an online store. <laughs> yeah. And Mona would like to know if you have a podcast. Nope, not yet. That's another thing that's on the to-do list. Now, nice. there's the picture. Um, you play the piano? I see a piano behind you. 
occasionally, not as, not as often as I could. Ah, uh, now I have to share screen again. I'll remember to shut it off this time. I promise. It's okay. I should have done it. I was. Yeah. I love that one. I mean, you, do you, is it just me or do you look like, you know, 10, 15 years younger? Well, thank you. That's and awesome. The, you know, and, I mean, it just like, like it, it's amazing. Well, and they, there were another great story. Uh, my mom and dad came to visit kind of shortly after I'd gotten to, to maintenance range. We took them to a concert, dropped them off, and we were picking them up afterwards. So we pull up, there's cars behind us. There's people waiting to get rides home. And, and, uh, we pull up and I roll the window down and I see my parents and I'm like, right. And they start walking towards the car. And then my mom looks in the passenger seat, bends down a little bit and goes, Oh, I'm sorry. We thought you were someone else and walks away. And my husband is like, have they been drinking? What's going on? I'm like, mom, get in the car. That's hilarious. They recognize me. They literally, my own parents did not recognize me. That is a funny story. Oh my goodness. That's hilarious. Uh, Schlinder would like to know, how did you begin your vegan eating and what foods do you choose to eat now? Um, the whole food plant-based started all I had, all I had left to, to swap out was egg white omelets and, and chicken breasts. That's pretty much all I was eating in the meat world. Um, what do I eat now? Now I have, uh, I have a lot of ingredients. Like I eat the same thing every day, but it's a little bit of, of everything. I have a oatmeal with greens, berries, and a cut up apple. And I have a smoothie with that used to have bananas, but now there's research that if you have bananas with your berries, that you're not getting the full benefit of the berries. So I switched to surprisingly Japanese sweet potato, white beans, um, mango greens and, and berries in my smoothie with flaxseed, wheat germ, and psyllium husk. And then for supper, it's always a giant bowl of like 300 grams. So almost a pound of, of raw salad, chopped salad. Oh, chopped salad is the best. You get so much, you can get so much in without all that chewing. Uh, yeah. And then on top of that is sweet potato and a few grains. And um, depending on where I'm at in my journey, uh, pumpkin seeds. I eat a few walnuts in the day if I'm need something, I'll have banana and ice cream. Chef AJ tells me I need to get a ninja, ninja creamy. creamy. Yeah. Because they don't make the champion. <laughs> if they still made the champion, I'd tell everybody to get the champion. <laughs> oh. Um, that, that, that's kind of, and then, you know, whatever I feel like I can eat off the Costco sample tables, depending on where I'm at in my journey. So funny. Cause I was at Costco today. There really wasn't anything I wanted to try. I just, I don't know. Been... We have a unicorn Costco in medicine hat. Like I don't know. I've I've gone elsewhere and it's like, oh, I don't even want to be in here, but it's not as busy in our med. And they have like, when they're fully staffed, they have 12 to 13 sample tables. I mean, it's a cornucopia of. Yeah, I don't think we had that many. They were, I think they had kimchi and salami. So I don't eat animal products. So it was easy because the kimchi had shrimp in it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. The bakery, does make it Costco, Costco bakery is another story, but they don't, <laughs> they don't sample that. Thank goodness. They hey, don't. So not at my Costco. I mean, you can, oh smell, but I haven't seen them sampling it. Wow. Hey, Darcy says, Rondi is a beautiful person inside and out at all sizes. She's absolutely a breath of fresh air. And Susanna wants to know what is the hardest part about maintenance for you? Sugar. Hmm. That it's plain and simple. Um, some people have a salt thing. Some people have a savory thing. I have a, I, I like, I know you said sugar and fat, but I'm, I'm literally a person who would eat brown sugar off a spoon. So for me, it's like, it's, it's definitely sugar. I mean, that's embarrassing to admit, but Hey, I, I try to keep it real. What do you think about the term food addiction? Do you believe it? Cause you know, a lot of my guests do, but a lot of the doctors don't think it's an addiction. Um, I think it is. I, I, because I will eat sugar to my detriment. Therefore, I think it's an addiction. I, yeah. I think it is possible to be addicted, but I'm, it's not a, 
I don't, it's not a food addiction. Cause like I said, I don't sit down and, you know, go crazy for kale or eat a pound of celery, hmm, more celery, yum, yum, yum. You know, it's definitely the processed stuff. Yep. I hear you. Uh, Jennifer says, what did you, what does your dad say or think about your new look? And do your parents eat like you? Uh, my dad is super proud of me and tells anybody who will listen about my journey and my story. Do my parents eat like me? My dad, my dad is whole food plant-based as well. He definitely tries. He's more, um, Esselstyn, uh, no, no fat, not even from, um, nuts and seeds, that kind of approach. Um, my mom still eats meat. So they have a, and again, a, a relationship where they, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's a, a really good way to put it. They both make their own meals. Uh, like my husband and I did when I was, well, we, my husband and I still do. It kind of became a thing where it's like, well, you know, I don't have to cook for somebody else and my stuff. Oh, that's the other thing I forgot to mention. Chef AJ food prep, food prep is huge. I do it all the time. Everything's in the freezer. It's ready to go. That way, when you have to make a decision, it's easy to make a good decision because it's already there. I don't have to cook it. It's already cooked, ready to go. Um, otherwise, I probably would end up with more processed food because it's just, it's fast. Although, although I don't know who said this either, but there's nothing more quick than an apple or a banana. I mean, how fast do you need something to be? Yeah. yeah. So you do like your own batch cooking? Yes, Absolutely. It's batch important. cooking. Yeah. The grains are batch cooked. The beans are batch cooked. The oatmeal is batch cooked. The the salad, I don't know. In my original presentation, there's that giant used to be used to be used as a bun bowl, but I don't bake bread, bake buns anymore. So now it's my giant chopped salad bowl that I make in advance. As long as all the ingredients are going to last for four or five days, and I don't put anything fermenting in the salad or wet like no cucumber, no celery, no tomatoes, just uh, greens and a little bit of onion and broccoli, cauliflower, carrots. It lasts for four or five days. No and problem. The sturdy stuff. Yep. Has anyone asked you to help them lose weight or coach them? Um, Not specifically, no. And I, I don't know that I would have been ready until recently to to take that on. Um, it's kind of, I did a friend of mine, I did challenge a friend of mine to go whole food plant-based and she, she did for a while and she said, Oh, I feel good. But it, as, as you know, and I'm sure your viewers know, and a lot of people know for some reason we go back and that's, that's where I'm really starting to dig in and do more research now on the mental piece of things of why, why can't I really let go? Um, I, I know Dr. Goldhammer would say, cause you haven't stopped eating sugar. Like, hello. <laughs> but yeah, it's a, it, yes, I believe you a question from a live viewer. Do you feel that COVID and, or the economy made it tougher for people to eat healthy and shop? Uh, I didn't find it tougher, but that's because the stuff that I was shopping for, nobody else was shopping for. Like, there were empty, yeah, exactly. there were empty shelves remember, of everything else. Remember that. But I'm like, I had no trouble getting greens. <laughs> and nobody, yeah, nobody was stocking up on, on kale. No, that's so true. So I, I, people say it's more expensive and I, I, I will grant you it's, it can be more expensive in the transition. If you're still having the meat and you're trying to get the fresh organic vegetables, it might be a little bit more expensive, but if you cut out the meat, what's cheaper than a $3 bag of beans, which is way more meals than a steak. Yep. What advice do you give to people that, you know, have given up hope that they could lose weight? That it's here. Mm. You have to start here. Uh, you have to believe in your worth. You have to believe that you're worth positive change because we would never say to somebody else, you suck. You're horrible. You can't do anything. You give up. You don't, you're not strong enough to do this. You can't resist the cravings. We never actually say that to somebody else. So we need to not say that to ourselves. We need to be our own 
cheerleaders. And that's why I say harness the hangry because the hangry is really strong. So if you can harness it and get it to do something for your health, to make your health better, harness that power because we have, we have that power within us. We have to find it in our, our minds and be kind to ourselves and cheer ourselves on. What advice do you give to somebody that's had a snack accident? <laughs> <laughs> the next minute is not a good time to have another snack accident. Yeah, exactly. I don't, there's, there's no point in beating yourself up about it. Cause I, I'm a big believer in don't worry about things you can't change. That's already happened. You can't change that. Uh, so just make, make a, a vow to not have another one today. Or I, I used to really fall into, oh <laughs> yeah, I really ascribe to, oh, well, I've had one bad thing. So now I'm going to have every single bad thing that I want to have. And I'm going to have it all today. And then tomorrow I'll be awesome tomorrow. But then tomorrow was rough because I had all that, that really tasty crap the day before. And it was harder the next day. I think just be kind to yourself. Don't beat yourself up because you can't change the, the past. Focus on the future. It sounds like you'd be a tremendous coach if you wanted to be, and you have a very good attitude. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. That's That means a lot, actually, coming from you. I really, really appreciate that. Because I'm taking the Food Revolution uh, six-month coaching course, and I'm learning, like, I've done everything wrong when it comes to helping people, because I just kind of tell them what to do, but tell them <laughs> would kind of be very good at that because of just the way you were with yourself. Well, and it's a matter of finding what works for you. My, uh, and I, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to sell anything. I don't, I wanted to, my blog says inspiration is free. I just want to be inspirational. I just want people to know that there is another choice that, that, you can eat in a healthful manner, even in today's world that is 100% designed to not support you in that, in that goal, but it, it is possible. And it's a matter of letting go of what you think food has to be. And I don't know how many people have said to me, Oh, I can't eat walnuts. I don't like walnuts. And I'm like, I didn't like walnuts. I ate walnuts because they were good for me. And I said to myself, they're good for me. I'm going to eat them. And then you eventually like walnuts. I did the same thing with kale. I started putting it in smoothies with a bunch of sweetened yogurt. And then eventually it, you know, the sweetened yogurt worked its way out. You just, you have to, sometimes you have to do things that are uncomfortable and be a little bit uncomfortable to move forward. Yeah. I hear the saying, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. Yep. Nice. Well, it has been so nice meeting you. I'm so glad we connected finally and we were able to share your story. If people want to get in touch with you, do you have a, any social media presence or I, I know we have the link to the blog and I saw a Facebook group as well. Yeah. The fa the Facebook one is probably the best one. The blog kind of, <laughs> the blog kind of sits there and doesn't have much action, but I am a little bit more active on Facebook. Um, I had to step away from it for a while to, not focus on food all the time, I guess was my reason for stepping away, but I'm, I'm coming back into it now. And I'd love to see people if they want to reach out for sure. All right. Randy, you're such an inspiration. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Oh, it's a pleasure. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. We're going later all week this week because of the Truth About Weight Loss Summit. Thank you guys so much for watching. And please come back at 3 p.m. tomorrow for Vinegar and Spice and 